Good afternoon or good evening. I am Valentin Fuster uh, from Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York. And you know, this is a, this is a luxury for me. I have been here for many years uh, as head of Mount Sinai Heart. And you know, over these years, we have been able to recruit a real leadership. All uh, speakers tonight are internationally known in their own field. And I think we are covering all the aspects of cardiovascular disease. So it's a real pleasure for me to be able to, at least to moderate this discussion with real giants in this particular field of cardiology. Now I'd like to start by presenting four or five slides, very simple, to say that today when we talk about cardiovascular disease, we also talk about cardiovascular health. And that is we are all working with patients who have cardiovascular problems, but at the same time, we are investigating what maintains somebody to be healthy. And we like to approach these with different challenges depending on different ages. What happened between age uh, birth and age 20 years, for example? What are the challenges? It certainly is education. And what happens between age 20 and age 60? Maybe we think we are very healthy and we are not. Are we in any way capable to see what is going on with our arteries and so forth, which may lead to heart attacks and strokes? And then we can talk about later on between age 60 and 100. And one of the challenges is actually cognitive dysfunction, dementia, Alzheimer's disease. All of these has some relation with cardiovascular disease, but the question is, can we prevent it? So we are addressing this throughout the life. I just like to present to you something that maybe you are not aware of. And this is an interaction we have had between one journal that I am the editor, the Journal of the American College of Cardiology, the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute, and the Institute of uh, Health Matrix in Seattle. And we are looking about cardiovascular disease around the world. And let me tell you what's happening. In the bottom of the slide, you see within this red square, cardiovascular disease and mortality is increasing across the world. Something that people think is the opposite and is not. And this is something that we already published about a couple of years ago. Now, the question is where? is everywhere. What happened in middle and low income countries, the disease is increasing. In, up, in countries with are economically better off, let's say United States, for example, we are reaching a plateau. And that is the disease now is beginning to increase again after about a couple of decades, it was decreasing. And the question is why this bad news? And this is something published a month ago from ourselves, the same group. And here in green in 1990, this is in the middle, 2010, and this is 220. Just focus on the green because the green is the cause of the problem. Obesity, which may lead to diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. That's the problem. And this is actually across the world. So a lot has to be done. And I want just to show you that this is the way we are trying to approach this. First, we try to understand how the disease begins in trying that to prevent this to happen. These are the three H's in number two, zero to 20, 20 to 60 years, 60 years to 100. And we call primordial prevention when there are no risk factors between birth and age 20. Primary prevention between age 20 and 60 means we have to prevent the disease when there are already risk factors. How can we change these risk factors? And then also in the elderly, can we prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, cognitive dysfunction that may be related to the same risk factors of cardiovascular disease that I mentioned, hypertension, high cholesterol, etc. Well, two of us, BF is myself, of course, and Dr. Swiski, Philip Swiski, who will be talking, we are really very involved in these aspects that I am presenting here. 
And here on the right is new technologies by which we are addressing these issues of these three H's of health. Imagine, imaginomics means imaging and genomics, artificial intelligence, innovative therapeutics, single cell multiomics. Innovative therapeutics is interesting. Basically, we are learning uh, through working in health, what are the defense mechanisms that make us to be healthy? Can we enhance these mechanisms with new therapies? The new therapies in heart failure actually are enhancing defense mechanisms. Even the vaccines, mRNAs, mRNAs for a long time have been considered a manifestation of disease until it came about just a number of few years ago that mRNA were a defense mechanism, some of them, and this is how the vaccines were developed uh, uh, recently from mRNA enhancement of a defense mechanism. So therapeutics are very interesting because the new therapies are really, can we enhance the defense mechanisms? And here is the same slide, but here's something different. 60 to 100 years we call secondary prevention. And that is the disease is already there. What can we do to prevent recurrence or perhaps to make the individuals with better quality of life? Well, here we have three individuals, Deepak Bhatt, uh, we will, I will introduce in a moment, working in all these aspects across the board in terms of prevention as well as treating disease. Uh, David Adams, uh, surgically speaking, also treating disease uh, with, a, uh, you know, with cardiac surgery, Samin Sharma, treating disease just without cardiac surgery, but just what we call intervention. So this leads actually with uh, uh, four people here that I'm going to be asking a number of questions about uh, how they are managing all these aspects of health and disease. And let me introduce them. First of all, uh, David Adams, internationally known uh, cardiac surgeon. He's the... Uh, a cardiac surgeon in chief of Mount Sinai Health here. Uh, Dr. Deepak Bhatt uh, has just been recruited, he's taking my job. He's the head of Mount Sinai Heart. And Deepak Bhatt comes from Boston, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital, also internationally recognized. He has run a number of clinical trials with very interesting data that he's going to be talking about. And then we have uh, Shamin Sharma, uh, which actually, you know, is uh, absolutely a fantastic intervention. It's not surgical intervention. Uh, in fact, he has been considered the number one in the state of New York by the term in terms of uh, quality of the interventions, lack of complications, and good outcomes. And finally, we have Dr. Philip Switsky, who is the head of, so of the research here, Sharma is the head of the uh, Cardiovascular Clinical Institute. Dr. Swiski is the head of the Cardiovascular Research Institute. The only problem that I see with these people, uh, they are really all, most of them have a touch of Boston. And that is the Harvard system. That's where David Adams came from, from the Brigham and Women's Hospital. Dr. Bat, you know, comes from Harvard too, uh, Brigham's Hospital. And then <laughs> Dr. Philip Swirsky uh, from the Mass General Hospital. So you have to understand. So Dr. Sharma, I don't know what we can say, except I spent a few years in Boston. You didn't. So you are the only one that really is not part of this group. Well, anyway, having said this, I think it's the time to start. And, and uh, i like to really point out that the discussion we are going to have is very much what has been accomplished and where is the future. And let's, let's, and we are going to be touching about all the aspects of cardiovascular health and cardiovascular disease. First, Dr. David Adams. Uh, David, it's nice to have you here. Uh, you have recruited here a number of years ago. When was this? How long ago, David? This is year 22, Dr. Brewster. Oh, fantastic. Well, look, 22 years. Uh, you know, he's internationally known for his work, uh, certainly in valvular heart disease. And, and the first question that I have for you, David, over these 22 years, uh, you have been on a mission to develop 
the leading valve center in, in the United States. And certainly we are very close to that. And can you summarize how did you develop such progress in 22 years? Uh, and Mount Sinai is very well recognized in valvular heart disease and in mitral valve disease. Tell us what you have done. Yeah, yeah when, we, when I came here, as you know, Dr. Fuster, our goal was to build a reconstructed valve center that would really be second to none. We were very fortunate. We had a partnership with Elaine Carpentier, who was sort of the father of the field. He and I wrote a book together. And then with the help of this administration, we recruited a, a, just a world-class faculty. And with our strong imaging and support from cardiology here, I'm proud to say when, we, when I came here, we were the fifth busiest cardiac surgery program in Manhattan, and we are now the number one busiest program in the state of New York. Um, lead, and, and more importantly, like um, Samin's, we just followed his model. We are also recognized with the, the, the highest quality rating from New York State. So it's been a great journey so far. There's still a lot of work to do, but I'm, I'm obviously very proud of what we've accomplished so far. Okay, so um, I'd like to ask Dr. Vat, uh, you have not, you have been here for a few weeks now, but you are very well recognized on a number of uh, fields in medicine. And I would like to ask you, what areas of cardiovascular medicine are those that most excited you? You know, David Adams has been a pioneer in bubble of heart disease and reconstruction of valves. What about you? Sure, well, you know, First of all, it's great to be with such a distinguished group tonight and uh, to be able to speak with this audience. I think you really made an important point about cardiovascular disease and, and primordial and primary and secondary prevention. There's a lot, I think, written in the lay media about how heart disease is going away or it's conquered, a lot of focus on cancer. Obviously, cancer is a serious problem. But I think lots of people really aren't aware that cardiovascular disease is booming, as you mentioned, around the world, but even in the United States. And, and, and the pandemic has really set us back as a cardiovascular community where patients' cardiovascular risk factors are, are spiraling out of control. So I really think that uh, cardiovascular medicine is going to be playing an even more important role in our healthcare system, trying to get control of risk factors, things like cholesterol, diabetes, blood pressure, excess weight. I think all these different risk factors are really going to be addressed much more aggressively, much earlier in life uh, by a combination of lifestyle interventions and lifestyle interventions not just the usual when you go to the doctor and the doctor says, lose weight, eat right. Everybody gets that advice. It's not that useful or actionable, but I mean much more tailored advice to individuals based on their specific lifestyle, their genetic makeup, uh, and uh, using a lot of different modern technologies that are in evolution. I'm sure we'll talk about it later, but things like machine learning and artificial intelligence to really help us predict much better who down the road is going to have a problem, like a heart attack or a stroke, or what you were mentioning before, Alzheimer's disease, what an epidemic that is. So I think as these different technologies evolve, advances in artificial intelligence, advances in genetics, it's going to allow us to much more precisely redefine what we, we, what we mean by prevention and really tailor it to the individual, not just generic advice of, yeah, stop smoking, lose 10 pounds. I mean, that's good advice, but it's not always actionable advice. So I, I think in the next few years, we're really going to see a big change in predicting risk and then acting upon that risk to try to reduce it before that bad event occurs. Oh, but it's never late, is indeed. Uh, uh, Deepak, it's never late. Let's say uh, an 80 year old, you still can say to treat the blood pressure. Uh, we have to go much earlier, but I guess it's never late. That's a great message. Sometimes people think, oh, the horse is out of the barn. You know, I'm already older, I'm already overweight, what's the point of starting to exercise now? The data are very clear that even starting later on in life, middle age or even older age, starting things like a healthy diet, and maybe we'll get into later what, what, what we yeah, all we, we healthy will. Diet. healthy diet, 
maintaining a good weight, weight loss if someone's already overweight, exercising, all these things can be started even later in life and still have significant benefits. So absolutely, it's never too late, but it doesn't hurt to start early. Excellent. Well, Dr. Sharma, you, you, you keep opening arteries <laughs> and you come here whatever time, at 10 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, two in the morning. Dr. Sharma keeps opening arteries, but you know, you have a fantastic record in terms of safety. I think over the last 23 years, you have done, I mean, according to the state of New York, this is the safest place. And uh, how can you, how have you accomplished this? Uh, I mean, is, uh, how, how were you trained to do all of this so well? Yes, um, <laughs> Pooster, uh, that's a great question. And more importantly, knowing that involved with the New York State uh, Advisory Committee, myself earlier and now uh, Dr. Adams is there, that no center in New York State that both international program and surgical program have the double star safety ratings and the quality, no one except Mount Sinai. So this is good to, goes to testament. So coming back to then, of course, when uh, I came here, uh, became the director by you, made me the director in 1996, but always was the passion that take, not only take care of the blockage. So just said that by the time a person comes to me, all the prevention, all the factors which uh, everybody wants to do, uh, they have kind of failed and then they come to us. So clearly never late uh, in the life, whether from the medical management or for the international surgical management. So question always was that we can devise the strategy which is good for the patient and follow the patient before and after. So I think one of the reasons I would say success of Mount Sinai Cat Lab and Cat Lab or team is that not just considering the taking the blockage. Of course, people do. Uh, the uh, complication during procedure occurs, but very small. But it is the subsequent care which really established the in the lifespan of the patient, the total care. And I would say that one, dedication, coming up with the new techniques, new devices through the trial form before even they are approved by FDA and implement them to the appropriate patient and then create a teamwork of the people who are thinking almost this alike. So even if the head is not there, let's say myself, and then of course now Dr. Keeney and others not there, but even when they are not there, the culture of the same, that doing a right job, right procedure, and then follow the patient, I think that has really brought us to this level, uh, Dr. Fuster, that to maintain for all the reports uh, since 1994 of the PCI that we got the double star and now we are actually getting another point which is very important. When patients go home, readmission. So sometimes they get readmission and this is actually the big, uh, the quality indicator by the Medicare and those hospitals have higher readmission, they are penalized. And we actually, for since the report came for last seven years for readmission, Mount Sinai had the lowest, statistically lowest readmission after PCI. Well, I think that the other aspect is the communication that you people have with the patient is fantastic. I have to go back to Dr. David Adams now for a moment. David, all this started with uh, coronary artery bypass surgery, valve replacement. Then you came in and you began to really advocate for valve repair. And now here, people like Sharma, they are getting into all these new devices, stents for the coronary arteries, and now the valves are beginning to be introduced without surgery. Uh, can I ask you, how do you see all these interventionalists? And uh, what is your perception, David? You are a surgeon. He is not. Oh, I, I think, you know, we, we've, so for, for example, with the structural valve program, you know, our center really was one of the two pivotal centers helping to lead the actual trial nationally that resulted in transcatheter aortic valve replacement is the most important way we treat patients that have a blockage in their aortic valve. Having done that, and now our program again is one of the largest programs in the region and certainly one of the safest ones, but our valve program continues to grow, including this year. So I, I like what Samin said about culture. You know, excellence is really all about your culture, which I think you honestly have believed in both of us and help us set that up. But we've got a culture of excellence here. And I think that our we don't really compete. I think by working together, that's how we get our safety. 
outcomes. And if you have the safety and you have the culture, there's an endless supply of the patients. And that's that's what we've seen. Valentine is not, not a competition, but rather a, a I think collaboratively we, we help each other and we continue to grow. I'm glad you mentioned this. You know, I, I have to say at this moment, I feel very proud. This was the first institute of the country. We started here where we pull all the subspecialties together. And this integration, I think, has led to the family, which we are here today. This is the executive group of this family. And I think that I feel very proud about it. And and, and I think is, there is no competition. It's just how we can work together. Well, Dr. Swiski is very anxious to say something here. Uh, Philip, you know, uh, has been here one and a half years, Phil. That's right, I, yes. I think so, yeah. Uh, is the head, as I mentioned, of the uh, of the research institute, and uh, I, I like to ask you uh, something that you talk all the time, and is inflammation. What, what in the world? And everybody talks about inflammation. You open the New York Times, and you they talk about inflammation. What is going on with inflammation in our specialty? Well, so let me just, uh, to answer this question, let me just provide just a little bit of context. So, you know, at the beginning, Dr. Fuster, you, you said that uh, deaths from cardiovascular disease are increasing, and that is true, but it is also worth reminding ourselves that over the last 50, 60 years, there have been there has been tremendous innovation and improvement. And I think you know, on the one hand, we can look at the surgical innovations that Dr. Sharma and Adams talked about as being really critical to saving lives. We can talk about public health policy and sort of the third bucket here is scientific discoveries, right? And so it is scientific discoveries that have provided us with some of the insights that then uh, about cardiovascular health, about cardiovascular disease that have allowed us to address uh, and, and target therapeutically. But scientific discoveries, uh, science keeps moving, keeps progressing. And this is really where I come in, where I'm very much interested in uh, some of the fundamental science. And uh, one theme that has become uh, very interesting over the last 10, 15 years or so is the role of inflammation, is the role of the immune system in cardiovascular health. And really what we are learning is that um, inflammation plays a, a very important role. You know, we think of in sort of the scientific community as atherosclerosis, which is this process uh, uh, where, where there's accumulation of plaques and vessel walls that can be a root cause of heart attacks or stroke, that atherosclerosis is a lipid-driven inflammatory disease. So there is very considerable engagement of inflammation or of the immune system, which is the body's defense system, in uh, cardiovascular health and in cardiovascular disease. And so the- So inflammation is a defense mechanism. A defense mechanism that we need. And this is what's very important to understand. Uh, inflammation it, it can protect us against infection. Inflammation uh, plays multiple roles in, in cancer, in, in neurodegenerative diseases, and it has vital roles to play, but too much of a good thing it can also harm us. And this is where inflammation is a double-edged sword and can be harmful. And indeed, we have evidence that in the case of cardiovascular disease, there are components of inflammatory cascade that are, are harmful. And learning more about how those components interact with one another is a, a major interest and possibly an area for further exploration and therapeutic uh, discovery. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bhatt, uh, I have a question here. And the question is, individualized medicine, which you mentioned actually, versus medicine that is not individualized. Let, let me give you an example. Uh, you know, in a way, there are a number of risk factors that affect us. Number one killer today is hypertension, for example. Well, I don't see this is, has to be individualized. It's just we have to treat blood pressure. And then you can say one individual versus the other. Now, I want to present this to you because genetics go into completely the other direction. And that is, well, you can have a high blood pressure, but you are a specific individual who needs a specific drug to treat blood pressure. I'm a little skeptical about that, but I'd like you to 
really bring the field of genetics here into the future because I am very much a general generalist. I believe blood pressure has to be treated. What drug we give, we have to see patients are different. But you come with genetics now where you are individualizing uh, a person and with a special treatment, very much in, in cancer, this is the way to go. Is this in cardiovascular disease too, you think? Yeah, I think it's a terrific question, and it'll be a question for the next decade, and, and I hope one that uh, here at Mount Sinai we can continue to lead in, in answering those type of questions. So for sure, many things should be deployed on a public health level. That is, decreasing salt intake is in general a good thing for helping lower blood pressure. Uh, smoking cessation campaigns, that's really good. Trying to prevent young folks from starting vaping, that's what's hot these days. So, so there, I think, a message of one for the masses, for the populations, it, it makes a lot of sense. Uh, as you said, for things like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, the most important thing is to treat it. Uh, the biggest problem we face uh, out there is that there's just under treatment of these risk factors. Then though the question does come, what's the best way to treat it? So for sure, treating it anyway is better than not treating it, but can we treat it in a way that minimizes side effects, uh, maximizes benefits and minimizes societal cost? That's about something else we have to think about, especially in US healthcare, costs are also spiraling out of control and, and, and that's not sustainable. So I think that genetics does give us an opportunity for certain disease states to be very precise in our therapy. Uh, there are certain disease states, things like cardiomyopathies, weak heart muscle, that definitely have a genetic basis where earlier diagnosis can be useful to try to prevent heart failure from developing in certain families where, where heart failure runs in the family, so to speak. So that's a very clear use of genetics even right now. But for common conditions like the ones you mentioned, high blood pressure, I think eventually there could be a role for genetics. I'll give you a very specific answer to that question. For example, some folks probably have blood pressure that's very aldosterone sensitive, and those sorts of patients should probably be on medications that target aldosterone. And probably in the next couple of years, there'll be some drugs where the FDA actually approves uh, aldosterone synthase inhibitors targeting a very specific chemical pathway. So I, I do think genetics will help inform uh, the treatment of common cardiovascular risk factors, but that's a few years away from more specific diseases yeah. like the ones I mentioned. Well, I'd like to, uh, let me tell you something I like about the surgeons like Dr. Adams. I have been working on adherence to medications, uh, Deepak, and you know this well. You know, of people who have high cholesterol today, you know, only 40% are being treated appropriately. So this is why I'm so generic. I mean, we can go into something specific individual with a specific disease, and I agree with you. This is getting into the next few years. What I like about the surgeons, and I have been working close to the surgeons since I was at Mayo, always close to the surgeons, is there is no adherence. They just solve a problem. <laughs> and I think, they, they, no, but this is, this is a very impressive issue. Uh, many times... You know, at least this is what is attractive about cardiac surgery. Uh, is that right, David? At least you can solve a problem and that's it. And Dr. Sharma, in a way, also the same. And I'd like you to comment about this. Adherence is an issue today. If we can have something that just solves the problem, I think is a great advantage. Is not correct? Well, we, we, Samin and I picked intervention and surgery, Valentin, because we don't do well waiting for our report card. We like to get the final result right away. So <laughs> in our business, we find out whether we're successful or not quickly. But um, yeah, I'll tell you about when I think about my mom before she passed away and all the pills she was taking and the pill boxes and all the help she needed to keep it all straight. I mean, I think you are hitting on one thing, and that is that, you know, we need to keep simplifying that. Not only do we need more targeted therapy, but we need to recognize the the older that you get and the more drugs there are and the more targets there are, the, but we can't forget that we can't make this a chemistry experiment every morning. So I do think some of the work that you've done in that arena is maybe going to be one of the answers pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Bach, by the way, is also an interventionalist, so I don't want to keep you out of the loop. Yeah. <laughs> He's also like Dr. Sharma. Let me go back to Dr. Swirsky. Now, 
you're interested in your sleep. What's the problem? Uh, I mean, in today's, the American Heart Association, just for people to know, came up with eight risk factors that we have to take care of. And I want to tell them one by one. It will take only 15 seconds. Two are mechanical, obesity and high blood pressure. Two are chemical, high cholesterol and diabetes. Three are behavioral, smoking, lack of exercise and poor diet. And now there is the number eight, poor sleep. Can you tell us what in the world is going on here? Yes, so, I, so this is a great point. So life's essential, it was life's seven, now it's life's essential eight, and I'm happy to see that sleep is now in life's essential eight. So we can think of it in a few ways. Uh, I don't think I need to convince anyone that sleep is important. I think everybody just intuitively knows how they feel when they lose a lack of sleep or when they have jet lag, when their sleep is interrupted because of a number of things that can interrupt sleep. Um, and, and, and indeed, we have plenty of evidence that there is an association between poor sleep and cardiovascular disease. You yourself, uh, uh, Dr. Foster, have published uh, work looking in human cohorts to showing that individuals who have interrupted sleep have an accelerated rate of a progression of cardiovascular disease. So, so we know all this. Uh, the motivation for us, and specifically the kind of work that we do at the Cardiovascular Research Institute, which is exactly that. It's a research institute devoted to getting fundamental, to generating fundamental knowledge about our biologies. And so our motivation when it comes to sleep is not to prove or disprove that sleep is good for you or bad for you. We know that it is. But rather, it is to better understand what happens at the, at the scales sort of underneath your skin uh, and uh, at the scale that can only be seen through a good microscope, at the cellular tissue scale, at the molecular scale. What happens when we interrupt sleep? What happens biologically? Because if we really better understand some of the fundamental science that happens as, as our bodies respond to interruption of sleep, or uh, conversely, what happens when we have good sleep, that regenerative sleep, what happens in our brain, what happens in our blood, what happens in our liver, what happens in our heart, we will uh, be able to identify new pathways, new ways, innovative ways that perhaps we were completely unaware of uh, uh, to target those ways, uh, those pathways, those molecular conversations, and perhaps then also devise new strategies for intervention, for therapeutics, new medicines. Well, uh, sleeping, is, 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 sleeping is becoming a problem, but I will tell you what we found is worse the interrupted sleeping than the sleeping few hours. Sleeping less than seven hours can be a problem, but much more the interruption of sleep. So thank you very much. Samina, I have to ask you a question. How you feel when with a catheter you open up an aortic valve and then functions normally, and now a mitral valve, and now, uh, you know, with Adams and others, the tricuspid valve. What is your feeling when you finish that procedure? Well, I mean, actually, the, the biggest thing which we have done so far uh, is for the aortic valve. So aortic valve, actually, as you know, the, happens in the old age. The valve very become calcified. And it does not open. And uh, many patients, of course, are good for surgery. But this is the large number of uh, patient population where because they are 80, have some stroke, some lung disease, they were not getting surgery. So this uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement called TAVR came, started its journey for identifying those patients. So who are high risk for surgery and can what can we do? And of course, uh, with me and Dr. Adams, we did the first case of uh, evil, the Metronic core valve on December 18, 2010, so 12 plus years ago. So the the and effects are immediate. One immediate effect that the valve, you know, we check the pressure across the valve and how much valve is opening by echo. It's opening just about, not exactly the normal person, but just about there. And uh, there's no gradient. And then next day and day after, patient feels tremendous. Terrific. 
So this is for the aortic valve. And these patients have done now studies have shown the valve lasts long enough uh, we have data up to eight plus years that is good as long as the surgical valve, as well as the tower valve is good and uh, immediate uh, gratification of the patient. Now, I cannot say exactly the same for other valve. The mitral valve we do uh, with the repair, with particularly the clip, but in that compared to aortic, when we take care of the problem altogether, in mitral, we decrease the problem, but we do not eliminate. What Dr. Adams does that eliminate the regurgitation. Here we from significant regurgitation make it mild, but still there is some. So we do some improvement. The dramatic improvement, which is shown in the patients with the aortic, I would say about half of the patient uh, with the mitral. But these are the patients who are not getting surgery because they are okay. multiple risk factors. But key is the effect is immediate and very gratifying, Dr. Huster. It's very gratifying for us as physicians and to see these patients too. Uh, Dr. Bhatt. Uh, artificial intelligence, you know, I would say to you, there are good and bad things about it. Perhaps I will ask you for the good ones. Uh, tell us where is it going, just very briefly. Sure, I, I think, you know. In it, our field, of course. So, so, well, even just in, in the world, I think it's really uh, going quickly. Probably a lot of folks are already uh, in the audience are familiar with things like chat GPT, and all the, the media buzz around it. Uh, so, you know, things are moving very quickly in the field, uh, but it's, it's a bit like genetics where, you know, it, it's always the next new thing, even next year and the year after. But, but I think we're actually at a point where there are going to be uh, direct benefits of AI and related technologies in medicine. So for example, in image detection, uh, the reality is to recognize patterns, uh, machines are better than humans. Uh, when it comes to different complex visual patterns. They can see things in x-rays that human eyes can't see. Uh, and assuming that uh, the input into any sort of AI algorithm is accurate, well, then the output can be much better than a human. It, you know, it wasn't that long ago, it was in our lifetimes that computers went uh, to, uh, you know, being able from uh, not doing things like beating world uh, grandmaster chess champions, to being able to do it. So that's in our lifetime. So since that, what I think is a pretty momentous event in human history, computers have come a long way. And I do think their ability to aid physicians, not replace physicians, to aid physicians in making diagnoses, in interpreting complex images like chest x-rays or cardiac ultrasounds is already pretty good and is going to get better. Right okay, now, but let me ask you a question, Deepak, I, Deep, sorry, but... This is a question, though. Uh, in my view, half of the patients we see, or half of the manifestations that the patients that we see clinically are actually related to their personality, to their perception of things, to their reactivity. Do you think artificial intelligence is going to get into what today is the patient-doctor relationship that is so important? The thing I'm trying to make here is that I think technically speaking, you are right, the interpretation of x-rays and technology, but I still think there's a lot to do with the importance of the patient-doctor relationship because the emotional aspects of disease are so prevalent. I just want to make this comment. Oh, no, no, I agree with you. Like I said, I don't think machines will replace humans, at least not in the context of providing medical care. That will always need the human touch. But yeah. even in areas such as assessing symptoms, actually, I was involved with a study called Hermes, where we used machine learning and artificial intelligence to, to really figure out if the symptoms patients were telling us were or were not ultimately correlated with whether they had coronary artery disease on an angiogram. And it turned out actually that using AI was better at predicting who had heart disease than just human beings were. And it wasn't because human beings were stupid, it's because machines were actually more objective. And we found, for example, that the common myth in medicine that women have different symptoms than men when they're having heart attacks wasn't actually true. In fact, what we found was that both men and women most often yes. had chest okay. pain when they were having heart attacks, but the way women described their symptoms was different than how men would describe it. And the way that physicians, and in that study also physicians assistants, heard the symptoms 
was very different. So most often a woman would mention that she had chest pain, but she might mention other symptoms like easy fatigability or shortness of breath first. And sometimes the physicians and physician's assistants would dismiss the symptoms, whereas artificial intelligence, at least in that circumstance, was more objective. It heard the chest pain, and it therefore was a little bit more accurate at diagnosing. So even when it comes to things where we think, oh, it's got to require the human touch, sometimes machines can provide a certain degree. Yeah, I agree. Of I agree. But let's put it 50%. Okay? <laughs> yeah. You and I will plan. I think it's a little Doctor, too high. Yeah, Dr. Adams, I have an important question to you. What is the most exciting new development uh, that you predict in the next few years uh, in the in the field that you're working on, what we is the thing that may be stimulating to you? Yeah, we. Uh, I, what I am probably the most proud of in my entire uh, tenure here is the work we've been doing um, the last two years with um, imaging and with um, with our EP service, unlocking the mech the the. the reason why sudden death has always perplexed patients that have mitral valve prolapse. There is, since the very first descriptions of mitral valve prolapse, um, sudden death has occurred in a small number of the population of patients that you follow with that. And um, as you know, our, our group working in a very collaborative fashion with no silos in this heart hospital have really begun to unlock the mechanisms of, of, of papillary muscle fibrosis and ischemia related to these large prolapsing valves. And I think that um, that work is going to um, be absolutely instrumental in, in tailoring the timing of mitral valve intervention in the future, as well as preventing sudden death. So it's probably the thing I'm the most proud of, of anything here we've done in reconstructive valve surgery. I think it's very nice the interaction with the electrophysiologists here, uh, in all sorts of arrhythmias and uh, atrial fibrillation and so forth. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, if I could just say, Valentine, your focus on imaging from the early days that I came here, because the the thing that really has mattered is our ability to use sophisticated scanning to identify <laughs> cellular inflammation. So this has really been the key that's unlocked it. So it can't be underestimated the the the, the skill level of, of our imaging services here. Well, I think imaging actually is going to tell us who is developing the disease in mid-age, you know, with very simple looking at the arteries of the legs, for example, with a device and you can tell where it is where the disease begins. But anyway, this is exciting. The well of imaging, genetics, artificial intelligence is very exciting. Now, Dr. Sharma, what excites you now in terms of the future, next 10 years? Tell us just very briefly. Yeah. What so, do you no, think? I think, yeah. so one uh, which has been, uh, I would say, uh, kind of uh, working for many years is Patients, particularly the elderly patients, uh, they develop the blockage, but there's a lot of calcium in it. We call calcific blockage. And what happens is when you take care of them, they have more complication because the artery can, can rupture, the stents cannot go. So what we have been, we have devoted my, I would say, major part of the time and still continue that how can we, one, identify what type of uh, calcified blockage is, and that's where the imaging comes in. But it's the intravascular. Let look by the microscope inside the coronary artery, uh, calcium, and what is the appropriate management, how to shelve it or crack it by various techniques, a uh, combination of the, and the, the device, uh, you know, multiple uh, tools which we use, combine them to get the best results. So clearly, to me, most exciting, of course, besides having the Val replacement, we will continue to do and a lot of happening. Uh, very exciting field there is. But from the coronary point of view, treating, uh, diagnosing, diagnosing properly and properly treating for good, short and long-term outcome without complication in this complicated calcific blockage uh, is really exciting. Thank you, Dr. Swiski. A very exciting field today is that the risk factors that affect uh, people in earlier age, all the eight risk factors are affecting the brain. Uh, is this why you are getting into the brain these days? Absolutely. So, you know, what I would say just by context, again, is that 
science or investigation, uh, the generation of knowledge is endlessly interesting. And you know, things that we might have, uh, we think we've known uh, that we've discovered years ago still continue to surprise us as, uh, as our technologies improve, as we um, dig deeper and deeper into the mysteries of, of the universe that's inside us. But if you're absolutely right, uh, something that I find personally uh, extraordinarily interesting is the role of the brain and the nervous system in general in, in the con that, uh, and its role in cardiovascular health. We're discovering that there is a deep and important conversation that is taking place between the heart and the brain. The heart is innervated. The brain um, listens to what happens in in the, in the vessels, listens to what happens in the heart and, and conveys that information to, to the heart and the brain. So there is a bi-directional conversation. We're only scratching the surface of this. I think it's going to become uh, in, in increasingly more interesting and uh, we're, we're, we're poised to, to hear a lot more about it as numerous laboratories uh, around the world are really, uh, really starting to take this very seriously. Uh, and using some of the uh, greatest uh, novel tools that are available to scientists to really unlock these mysteries. Dr. Adams, just very briefly, we have to get a couple of more minutes and then we'll have questions. Maybe we can go a little bit over about 15 minutes of questions. But Dr. Adams, cardiac transplantation, the peaks. <laughs> As you know, one of the reasons you... <laughs> One of the reasons I got my, I always say, one of the reasons I got to sit here was that um, I spent a number of years at the Brigham working in primate xenotransplantation, looking at, at pigs that were genetically modified that, to, to lack human complement regulatory protein. And you know that this made, you know, some new news uh, recently where um, one of these hearts now lasted for an extended, extended period of time before the patient passed away. I think it's really fascinating. I'm, I'm afraid I still, still think there's a lot more work to be done. I'm not sure that Norman Shumway wasn't right. Xenotransplantation may be in our future and always in our future. Progress has been made, but having spent a number of years in that field, it, it is a very difficult, it's very, it's, a, it's still a very challenging obstacle to overcome all of the you know immune pathways that we we are born with so we, we will see I, i'm still would put my money on mechanical support and living lining tissue thank you dr Bat. finally what do you see mount sinai heart in the next 10 years i, I see it continuing to do great things and lead the field of cardiovascular medicine and cardiovascular surgery globally uh, the work that's going on here is incredible. I think, you know, the, the, the people uh, that have been speaking before me here have been extremely humble. I mean, Dr. Adams' contributions to revolutionizing mitral surgery really can't be overstated. You asked Dr. Sharma a little bit about calcium. The fact of the matter is he's the world's expert in treating calcium with stents and drills and other sorts of technologies from the inside. And Dr. Swirsky and his recruitment from Boston is amazing, bringing the level of basic and translational science here to as high as anywhere in the world. So uh, really where I see Mount Sinai heart going is to even greater heights, uh, bringing together surgeons, cardiologists, scientists in a way that I think no other center can in the city that I think is the most dynamic city in the world, New York. So I, I really uh, see great things in the future. Thank you. Uh, now this is open to questions, uh, and and we'll tell the answers will, should, should, will have to be very very short. Otherwise, we'll not be able to. <clears throat> it's open to questions. Uh, first question: uh, How can patients and support? Excuse me. This is. Can can you put? No, the questions against chat. How can patients and supporters assist in the effort, both financially and through other support mechanisms, like voluntary your time? Well, I don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> I would like to say that uh, all of us have to contribute in one way or another. 
uh, uh, that, that's that's the fact of the matter. I would say to you that uh, at least uh, financial support has been absolutely critical into what we have developed in the last few years here. But this is not only financial support, there's support in many, many other ways. And actually, we have a number of patients that are serving our purpose also in a voluntary way. So what I'm really saying to you is that uh, the, any way you can contribute is, uh, is really acceptable and, and makes this place greater. Valentin, I wonder if I could ask you a question that's come in on the chat, and that is about COVID. And it's about, about COVID. Yeah. And its effect on the heart. And one of the questions was around um, can, could it cause pericarditis um, and just in general around inflammation. So I wonder if it, it, you've certainly seen the world's literature on that as the editor of Journal of Bearing College of Cardiology. Can you tell us a little bit about that, where we stand today with COVID and the heart? Well, uh, <clears throat> at least the data is that COVID uh, that makes a patient to go to the hospital, which means fever and feeling really... Uh, with a number of problems that needs to be admitted, that patient, 35%, there is injury to the heart, to the muscle of the heart, which is manifested by a chemical that is released from the muscle, from the muscle of the heart called troponin. And this data actually originated in this institution. Now, pericarditis is less common, uh, that is uh, the COVID affecting the pericardium, and COVID causing heart attacks is much less common. But certainly a touch of COVID into the muscle of the heart is very common. And in general, it doesn't have any kind of repercussions. The problem with COVID, however, is that after it has affected a number of people, there are symptoms which are not related to the heart, but are symptoms that we call autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and that is fatigue. Uh, cough, uh, one doesn't feel well, and this can last for a long time. And this is actually one of the issues to me that is most uh, crucial to, to, to investigate at this time, and that is how an infection like COVID can affect you for a number of months. But certainly the heart can be involved. Uh, with vaccination, which is a question that is so often asked, the, the uh, significant effects on the heart or even in cardiac mortality is very, very low. So it uh, doesn't mean that uh, vaccines doesn't have some side effects, but I would be very much against the concept that you're going to be vaccinated and the heart is going to be really a problem. I think we should get away from that. And, and if I may just add one, uh, one thing is that there is quite a bit of interest, scientifically speaking now, about the relationship between uh, infection, viral infection, and heart disease. And studies are ongoing to sort of better understand how uh, the, the viruses uh, harness and uh, certain parts of the immune system that are also sort of relevant. And so this gets back to this concept of inflammation that was mentioned earlier. So this is ongoing studies. Some of these studies are, are ongoing at Mount Sinai, uh, some of the immunologists, urologists, and also here at the Institute. Oh, well, I've got to say, because I'm sure Dr. Fuster won't, you know, probably uh, at this upcoming American College of Cardiology annual meeting in two weeks, there's going to be a major study that Dr. Fuster uh, presents regarding COVID uh, and whether uh, using blood thinning medicines is or isn't useful. So that uh, regardless of what it shows, is going to be a major contribution to the field. Well, thank you very much, but this is not my day. Today, I am only asking questions. Thank you. <laughs> Now, this is but a question I, here. Yeah, no, but no, Dr. Fuster, the COVID issue, and this is very common, and everyone is very frustrated. We get the patients coming. They say they have seen other doctors. All tests have been done. All have been negative. Even MRI, CAT scan, they have done the repeat echo, uh, and still continues to be symptomatic. And this is just we call COVID hall, long COVID hall. And this is the disease which we are trying to understand. And only that treatment is some kind of rehabilitation, get, there's no true medicine, palpitation is very common, and they're out of breath, shortness of breath and palpitation, the two most common. 
So yeah. what uh, what we know at present is just give some time and will hope it will slowly go away because there's no true treatment. Multiple tests are usually done and they're normal. Thank you. Uh, I want to, this is a question. How does the environment impact uh, heart health and cardiovascular disease? I can comment on uh, because in that uh, group that we work together with NIH and the Institute of, uh, of Metrics, uh, what we found is interesting that pollution actually is as harmful as smoking. So the pollution is, a, is, a, is like smoking and is a passive aspect. So I just want to emphasize that people who do not pay attention to this aspect now is becoming one of the critical risk factors for cardiovascular disease in terms of the environment. There's another aspect I want to comment about the environment, and that is we have a, a lot of work that we are doing with children in terms of trying to promote health at young age. And what we are finding is there is no question that if we want to have impact in the prevention of cardiovascular disease, there is nothing better than a healthy environment. The, the environment of the family, the environment of the place where you work and so forth, has a huge impact on results. And so I wanted to, the, both environments are quite different, but I wanted to take the opportunity to say that in terms of promoting health, the two main actually barriers are sustainability, how things can be consistent. If you lose weight consistently, you are you lost the weight of cigarette smoking cessation. But the other aspect that is also a challenge is the environment. We can go to the individual in trying to change their health and we may be, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we may be successful or not. But if you have an environment that is healthy, we are finding now in all of our studies, this is absolutely the way to go. So these are the aspects that are interesting in the prevention of disease. There's another question here. Any new research on atrial fibrillation and other arrhythmias and any new drugs on the horizon? Well, you know, uh, uh, Dr. Bad, do you want to comment on? Yeah, absolutely. Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disturbance or arrhythmia that there is. Uh, increasingly common as people get older. It's uh, estimated by 2050, the rates will be even higher. The number of people with atrial fibrillation will increase by millions. So it's a big public health problem. Uh, as it turns out, just to dovetail on what you were just saying, Dr. Fuster, uh, lifestyle changes, it, it turns out, actually matter for atrial fibrillation. That is, weight loss can help prevent atrial fibrillation. Uh, the people aren't going to like what I say next. Avoidance of alcohol can help prevent atrial fibrillation. It turns out there's research showing even just a drink a day increases the risk of atrial fibrillation and multiple drinks a day raises the risk substantially. So there are lifestyle things we can do. It turns out, yes, there are some uh, research studies going on with newer medications for atrial fibrillation. The problem, though, with a lot of medications that are used to control abnormal heart rhythms is that they have a lot of side effects. So where a lot of the advances have in fact been has been in using catheters uh, to actually ablate or sort of burn little tissue in the heart that's causing abnormal circuits to fire. And one of our doctors, Dr. Vivek Reddy, uh, is one of the world's experts in zapping those sorts of abnormal heart rhythms and actually curing atrial fibrillation in some cases, unlike medications, which sort of just control it for a period of time. So lots of interesting things going on in atrial fibrillation in terms of lifestyle, drugs, and procedures. Thank you very much. Uh, there are two minutes left. We said one hour, and there are two minutes left for the hour. So uh, any other questions? Here we have, has any any progress being made in doing mitral valve repairs without open heart surgery in a similar fashion as a tablet procedure? Who is the current procedure is still the best route? Dr. Adams and then Dr. Sharma. Yeah, so, so all mitral valve reconstruction requires open heart surgery. There are different ways we can make incisions in different ways, we can, different instruments that get us to the mitral valve, but the valve lives inside the heart. The heart's full of blood and is beating. So you have to have an open heart procedure to have a valve reconstruction. The catheter arena is full of ideas and patents, and there is only one approved device right now, and it's starting to be tested in, in, in healthier patients. Right now, it's reserved for patients that are not candidates for surgery. 
it will still have a very limited scope. The one difference and the reason we can treat almost all aortic stenosis with the catheter is because the aortic valve presents with a single pathology in general with stenosis, calcified leaflets. The challenge in the mitral valve is that it's inside the heart. It's a very tight tunnel. The blood exits the heart, which is behind the mitral valve, and it has numerous pathologies. So you'll see that the mitral field will... We will chip away at catheter solutions in the mitral space, but the progress will be much slower and have to be much more tailored. Yeah, and <laughs> and just Dr. Adams pointed out, so any of this, the percutaneous repair, like for aortic we are doing, uh, the replacement of the mitral valve or so, they're all still in the older people. Uh, even the trials which are comparing this percutaneous uh, approach with a traditional surgical valve repair, is all patients more than 65 years of age. But yes, appropriate patients, uh, particularly those who are high risk for surgery, can get a percutaneous repair. It's not an exact perfect repair, but in that, for many patients, uh, they do quite well uh, and uh, it's available, but it requires testing before we can say that this technique can be offered compared to mitral valve, surgical mitral valve repair can be offered to everybody except those who are very high risk for because of their baseline condition. But uh, percutaneous repair, patient has to be identified, tested, and then appropriate uh, uh, to fit in to uh, those uh, criteria before we go on to this non-surgical way. The collaboration is going to be the key. Yeah. Well, uh, this is a good way to finish when you talk, we say about collaboration. Can you imagine, and I tell the audience this, uh, these fantastic brains rather than compete, competing, working together. I mean, this is exactly what we have, and this is why we are so excited. We are, it's a friendly group. We all feel at home, and I think uh, uh, we wanted to present to you a little bit of a sense of this integration that we all have, which is part of our, really, our philosophy and the way we move forward. Anyway, thank you very much for being with us today. And I hope you something all of us learn. And thank you until the next time. Thank you all. Beautiful. Great. Great. Thank, thank you. you. Bye now. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dr. Fuster. Thank you. It was lovely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Valentine. Thank you. <laughs>